Today on the podcast, I have somebody joining us who is going to actually fill out some of the spaces that I feel have been missing from the podcast. So I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Anna Carlyle, who is a senior lecturer at Goldsmiths University, which interests me on another level because I did my first degree at Goldsmiths. So I feel a great affiliation to Goldsmiths. Her areas of consultancy and research and teaching are particularly around social justice and institutional prejudice, particularly on the basis of class, race, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia. She's deeply interested in youth voice, creative practice, parenting, inclusion, social policy and special educational needs and has conducted several pieces of research on LGBTQI parented families, and LGBTQI inclusive education in primary and secondary schools. So I don't even know where we're going to go today with all of that. Hello, Anna. Hello. Thanks for having me on the podcast. It's great to have you here. And can I just start off by talking about um, the fact that you work in the School of Education at Goldsmiths? Hmm. Well, do you know, go on, go on. Tell me what you just told me, because I think that is something that makes me want to. If I was somebody who whooped, which I'm not, I would be whoop whooping all over the place. It's never too late to start. (laughs) Well, what I told you earlier was that I have been listening to your podcast and I've been following all the links and reading up on all the ideas and concepts that your speakers have been talking about. And yesterday I went to talk to our head of teacher education, a lovely woman called Alison Griffiths, and I said to her, we need to completely rewrite everything that we're doing and frame everything around attachment aware, trauma aware, resilience and mental well-being. Um, I said, there's a gap here. And on this podcast, Lisa Cherry's podcast, which you have to listen to, There are all these amazing people who've got some amazing ideas. Um, And she said, great, let's do it. Send me an email with lots of links. So I did that yesterday. So I'm really excited to see what's going to happen. And hopefully we'll get you into Goldsmiths to talk to our, our colleagues about how we might be able to do this. I mean, on so many levels that that brings me like an emotional joy because it means that what we do and when we bring people together and when we open up spaces for conversations there's an opportunity for change and not just change with people who we know but actually change with people that we don't know and that's very powerful and of course i would love to come back to goldsmiths and wander about wander about over there because i just it would be (laughs) a blast from the past um One of the things I think that, well, one of the places I'd really like to start um, with you, Anna, is thinking about some of the intersectionalities that we shared in your um, introduction and what you perceive as perhaps some of the, the, the gaps that are in the thinking currently around trauma awareness and attachment awareness and, and how, how we might do something about that. Okay, so I think I need to just back up slightly and talk about how I got to do the work that I'm doing. And basically, I was a a secondary school teacher and I'd been teaching kids in Oakland, California, who were at risk of going to prison or who had been in prison. And then I moved back to the UK and taught young people who were at risk of or had been permanently excluded from school. And I just felt that there was this thread of institutional prejudice. It felt like if you were a black boy in year 10, you were lots more likely to be permanently excluded. People would would lose my students' transcripts and not seem to care about it. People would not seem to give much attention to the fact that bad things had happened to them, like maybe their mum had gone to prison or something. And that didn't seem to have any impact on whether or not they were permanently excluded. And the whole system seemed to me to be dysfunctional. And one day I was helping a young boy reintegrate into a mainstream secondary school. He'd been out of school for a long time and he was from an an Irish traveler background. We went to this school and we walked in and the receptionist said to me, 
she pointed a finger at this kid and she said, you, don't go nicking anything while you're here, will you? That was her introduction. And he looked up at me and he said, I don't think they want me here. And I said, I don't want you here, let's go. So we left. I went home that night and I said to my then partner, who was an anthropologist, I said, I don't know what to do. This is, this is awful. Like, you know, these kids have difficult lives. And then you've got this layer of institutional prejudice as well. The very institutions that are supposed to be helping these kids are putting up barriers. A lot of these, most of the teachers and practitioners, they're not bad people. You know, they have good hearts and they mean well and they want to help kids. But there are these structures and ideas and beliefs about different groups that are just getting in the way so much. And my partner said, you need to do a PhD on that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. So I did my PhD on um, permanent exclusion and institutional prejudice. And I looked at race, class and gender. Um, and I joined Goldsmiths. And I went from a job in a local authority where I was doing multi-agency support work and really fighting fires all the time with very little money and very difficult circumstances and it felt like the kids were being attacked on all sides institutionally as well as in terms of life circumstance. I went from that into teaching people at Goldsmiths who were becoming teachers and it just felt so incredibly constructive to stand in front of 200 brand new teachers and say you need to build relationships with the kids so they asked me to do a behavior lecture and i didn't talk about behavior management until the last 10 minutes because the whole lecture was about engagement and relevance and building relationships and that kind of stuff and that is why i absolutely love being at goldsmiths because it's all about social justice equalities and social justice are woven through all of our teacher education programs and that's brilliant. And then I started seeing this kind of upswell of stuff around trauma and resilience and attachment. I myself have a diagnosis of complex PTSD due to childhood trauma. I've been through lots of psychotherapy. So I completely get the, the power of addressing this kind of stuff. And I, I started hearing some kind of academic critiques of the trauma-informed schools, attachment-aware schools movement. And those critiques were saying, look, um, paying too much attention to the individual child is a great way to take attention off the institution. And sometimes when people talk about adverse childhood experiences, um, there is an edge of, there's a problem with you and your family without looking at us and our issues and our structural problems. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's the gap as I see it. Yeah. And, and I think that's really something uh, very much worth exploring um, because there, there are people who have interpreted, I think, looking at particularly the ACEs study, I think, as something that um, ignores um, systemic institutional abuse, um, poverty, uh, policy that deliberately creates poverty, uh, which we're living in currently. Yeah. Um, and how we, how we address that and create trauma responsive and trauma informed um, environments, cultures, organizations, um, because what I think I have found is that where there are organisations that um, do take on that particular way of thinking that is very individualised, and let's face it, we live in a society that's very individualised, so it's an easy thing um, culturally to do, that actually those staff are also suffering from being in those environments. So it's a double whammy, really. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what's your kind of... Um, thoughts around how we approach that how we might better approach that well i think um you could sort of do a little case study around the inclusion of transgender young people because that brings up a lot of this stuff so stonewall recently did a piece of research um, around suicidality amongst trans adolescents 
and they found that 47% had attempted suicide, which is a huge amount. Um, so what they found was that the reasoning behind that was mainly to do with the way that people were treated by others. So it wasn't to do with the internal dysphoric feeling about their body. It was more to do with prejudice experienced from other people. And so let's take a young person like that and think about them in a school, an institution. Now you might get a really nice teacher who's got a pride flag up in their, in their office or a trans flag up in their classroom that this kid feels like they can talk to. And that's a great start. But then which toilet are they going to use? Um, what are they going to wear when they do PE? What are they called on the register? Um, are they protected from bullying adequately? And all of those things require the institution to really commit to policy change, actually, and also to holding difficult conversations. There's been um, a lot in the media recently about LGBT inclusive education in Birmingham and um, families have, have been protesting outside the school and the media has set this up as a LGBT versus Muslim situation. But actually when you talk to um, people of faith about LGBT inclusion, which I have on a big piece of research, um, when you say to them, tell me what your faith thinks about this, they'll say, well, no religion condones bullying. So actually everybody's willing to do this and be inclusive. It's the institutional commitment to making changes and coping with maybe difficult conversations that is the, the hardest thing to make changes in really. And I think that's, that shows up in so many areas. I mean, I was working in a local authority um, a couple of weeks ago and much to my delight, they were really working hard on changing language. So moving um, uh, contact to family time and uh, various different aspects of language that seek to be inclusive and remove the whole them and us notion, which pervades so many of our services. Um, so adapting a, a different language, a different understanding. But, you know, just while you're speaking, so one of the sensory experiences that I have when I think about this is one of overwhelm because it feels so great and it feels so big and it feels so challenging. I mean, I feel like I've been fighting prejudice all my life. I mean, literally all my life, you know, that's as soon as I heard those kind of words and that language and understood that I had, you know, had that burning desire to just do something. Um, I, I'm not sure where we are with that currently. I'm not sure that I feel, you know, that we're moving forward in a great way currently. And I don't want to feel like that. I want to continue, you know, I'm a very positive person. I want to continue in that vein. And, and so I want kind of solutions and that, that overwhelm just creates this desire for, well, tell me the solution, you know, what are we going to do? So, I mean, that sense of overwhelm, do you think that's something that stops people from change? I do, but I also, I mean, one of the things I love about the conversations that you have with people is your sense of hope. And um, I take a lot of strength from it. And I do think there are solutions, lots of solutions. And one of them is to bring together the kind of person-centered trauma discourse with the inclusion equalities discourse. Because here you've got two enormous bodies of people who are passionate about how to make things better, who could be supporting each other and helping each other out. We just need to bring the two discourses together. Um, I've got a, a colleague who runs this amazing charity called Educate and Celebrate, and they do LGBT inclusive education. And they have a really simple way of um, creating institutional change. And it has um, a five point um, kind of approach and I'm their external evaluator. So um, this is where I've done a lot of this work on LGBT inclusive education in schools, serving faith communities and talking to teachers and kids and things about this stuff. And their five point approach is to 
is to take the Equality Act, which has a public sector equality duty in it. The public sector equality duty requires all publicly funded bodies to develop positive relationships between people of different characteristics. And it uses that word relationships. And the characteristics include disability, ethnicity, faith, sexual orientation, um, something they call gender reassignment, which they've clarified in Parliament to mean anyone who's thinking about changing their gender in any way, um, sex as well, marital status, age. And if you think, of, and this is a positive duty, if you think about um, asking schools to implement a positive duty to make people understand each other, that's such a beautiful opportunity. So what Educate and Celebrate does is they go into schools and they they do a complete audit of all the policies, behaviour, inclusion, um, parent contact, and they make sure that all of those protected characteristics are updated in the policies. Then they do a curriculum audit and they say, look, is everybody in these protected characteristics represented across the curriculum? And they take a usualising approach. So the idea is that it's so usual to come across um, a family with two mummies in it or a disabled person in your history or geography or maths curriculum that it no longer becomes a stigma or an issue. The third tranche they do is whole school training. So everybody in the school gets trained in the language, um, in how to respond if something comes up and they get the chance to say those stigmatised words, ask any question no matter how silly, get those questions answered so they feel um, armed with information. The fourth tranche is about community. So they do community rainbow bake-off competitions and singing and dancing, inclusion shows and things like that. And the fourth, the fifth one is about environment. So it's about asking the question, if a family with two mummies comes to this primary school and thinks, will my four-year-old feel happy and included here? How will they know just by walking into reception? So it's as simple as putting a couple of posters up, talking about how people are committed to inclusion, all of that kind of stuff. Now, this is all kind of an inclusion equalities approach. But if you think about the impact on the children and their personal experience, you can see how it can mitigate against trauma and support resilience. And I've got a, I've got a little story about that from my, from my four-year-old. So he was three, he was at nursery. And I'd been saying to his nursery for a long time, um, please can you get some books which represent his family um, you know he he always reads books which have a mummy and a daddy in it it would be lovely if he could see a book that has two mummies in it it would just help him to feel accepted and like he's normal like everybody else and I didn't think anything any would anything would happen and a few months later um, one of the nursery workers said oh Anna I've got a delivery let me show you and she opened up this packet of books and there was a couple of books and one of them was called Mummy, Mama and Me. And this one we've got at home, it's a little board book and it's about putting a baby to bed. And Mummy gives me a bath, Mama reads me a story, Mummy brushes my hair, Mama puts on my pyjamas. It's just the two mums are incidental to the story. And I, in the middle of nursery, I burst into tears. And I burst into tears and they, the nursery worker said, oh, I didn't realise. I said, listen, it's, this just says to you how rare this is. And then my three-year-old, grabbed the book out of her hand, ran into the book corner and cuddled that book. When I picked him up later, she said he'd spent most of the day cuddling the book. Now that, you know, that idea about institutional change, changing the curriculum, impacting on individual people's experience, that's the kind of thing I want people to think about really. There's so much in there. And I mean, from a tra trauma informed lens or an attachment aware lens what your little boy was doing was in a new environment was having a piece of home which was giving him that wonderful sense of belonging and of being known and um, I was talking with um, Rob Lowe uh, on the last podcast and that sense of belonging and that sense of being known is what really creates relationships and so, yes, when you layer all this stuff and you start thinking about the amount of things that have to alter and the amount of lenses that we can look through things, 
but we're all actually coming from the same place really which is about connection how do we create a place of connection and belonging um yeah. uh, i'm going to be having somebody on the podcast talking about county lines um in a couple of weeks and um you know that we know that that is a space that is opened up for people where that's young people where that sense of belonging might be more fractured um but at the same time that can be fractured within a school environment it doesn't you know it might be fractured in a home environment but this idea that it's everything is the parents fault and let's face it the mother's fault um, prevents some of that belonging that can take place within a school or within a community prevents that from being the central theme yeah exactly and the thing is that as some of your guests have said we need to think about the practitioners uh, mental health and and belonging too so you know if so one of your guests i can't remember her name but she's got a charity called the difference Ah, um, Kieran. Kieran, that's right. Kieran Gill, is it? Yeah. Yeah. She said. Um, she she said. You know, it sounds like a radical idea, but if you're going to ask people to look after, um, people who are having having a difficult time, you need to look after those people too. And and that was one of the things I said to the head of teacher education because we talk a lot about resilience at Goldsmiths, um. But we need to kind of bring in a system to make sure that really happens. And I think such a huge part of that is, is going to be about the adults in the room also feeling, feeling happy and comfortable. I really like the model of um, dyadic developmental practice because what it does is it brings in um, the responsibility of the adult as well to deal with their stuff. But in order to embed that systemically, you need to be in an institution that's going to support the adult to do that, to support the child to do that. And it's another example of how we need to think about institutional practice as well as individual practice and experience mm -hmm. and how they link together. Yeah, and I mean, certainly for myself and most other trainers that I know that um, train in the work that that I train in, which is around trauma-informed practice and attachment awareness, um, wouldn't dream of having a day without looking at um, what we might call self-care, which again has been quite popularized in the way that the word resilience has, but actually it's about how we take care of each other and how we take care of ourselves, because sometimes that's actually about making a demand and teachers, generally speaking, are not always great at making a demand. Teachers by nature um, can be quite compliant and are then less likely to say, actually, I've not had my lunch once this week and I need to eat my lunch. I mean, you know, it's never going to happen that I don't get to eat my lunch because I will be demanding that the space is made for me to eat my lunch. I mean, and I think... It's, so we can't remove the individual because there, there has to be that sense of responsibility of actually saying, do you know what, this is, this is not going to make me the best that I can be. These circumstances are actually causing me to feel too poorly to work with this particular situation. And that's difficult for people because people's jobs are on the line, because they are there's a hierarchy and a fear factor about how much you can do that and it's so the shift has to come from absolutely everybody in in relation to understanding and nurturing the fact that this isn't like some luxury thing that's about having a spa day this is about how our bodies function at their optimum this is about making sure we eat regularly this is about making sure that we sleep enough this is about making sure that our food is nutritional this is about making sure that we are resourced relationally and that we have the people around us to help us and if we have those basic things and let's face it we're really talking about the bottom rung of maslow's hierarchy you know then we can start to move into safety and then we can start to provide the kind of environment that children need. And, and I, won't, I won't make any bones about the fact that I say to people, it's great that we have 
people dealing, you know, who come into these professions with their stuff, because we do. Um, it's one of the great things about our professions is that there's so much lived experience within them and people who are passionate about making a difference. But then you have a responsibility to deal with your shit. And yeah. I will happily say that in, in, uh, in, in any training group that I have, although teachers usually get quite uncomfortable if I, if I swear. So I try and be better behaved than that. It's such, you know, it's, it's a kind of double-edged sword in a way because, yes, of course you have to deal with your shit. But at the same time, institutions don't tend to value your shit very much. This so, is very true. <laughs> so I'm an admissions tutor for an undergraduate program at Goldsmiths. It's called um, Education, Culture and Society. And it's just fabulous. And our students go on to become teachers, social workers, art psychotherapists, you name it, all kinds of things. It's really exciting. And as admissions tutor, I often go out and talk to Access course students and BTEC students about um, how to write a good personal statement. And I'll often say to them, if you've had a difficult time and have come through it and have learned something from it, put that on your personal statement. And they'll say, oh, you know, I, I was told not to talk about my personal stuff. And I'll say, look, it's a bonus. We want as many diverse people in the room as we can get because we all learn from each other and we're all experts by experience. And I always tell a story about one particular student who I first met in the second year. She came into my class called Studies in Inclusion and Exclusion. And she sat there with her legs sticking out and her arms folded, looking really pissed off. and like, I don't want to be here. And I looked at her and I thought, you look like an angry teenager. And she was, she was angry. And I just tried to build a relationship with her. I tried to use lots of eye contact and ask her about herself and get her to talk about her experience. And it turned out that she'd been involved as a, as a young person with a charity called PARS, Parent Action and Reconciliation Service. Mm -hmm. This is for families where um, kids are violent towards their parents. And she'd been one of those, those kids. She'd also been permanently excluded from school. She kind of admitted this with shame and I said, wow, great, do your essay on this. And she ended up doing an essay on PARS and then in the third year she did a placement with PARS and she just suddenly took off. She ended up with a first. She's wow. gone to be a teacher and within about five years she was a primary school deputy head. And this is someone who's dealt with her shit. She comes and tells me that. She's so strong and yet her horrible experience has become a form of great expertise that underpins her professionalism. So but you met that story of shame, not just with empathy, which is what we would say, when you meet shame with empathy, it evaporates, not just with empathy, you met it with that absolute passion of wow, wow, look where you've been. Yeah, exactly. Incredible. This is incredible. Yeah. I, and I have so many stories of that, you know, people who were in homeless hostels as teenagers, people who were abused as children, people who hardly ever went to school, you know, people who escaped from cults as teenagers, all sorts of things. And they bring their experience to bear mm. in, in the university classroom. And because it's valued, and we, we ask them to talk about themselves. It's quite kind of a process-oriented degree. Um, by the end, I think often people feel that they haven't come with baggage that's pulling them back. They've come with an engine that's driving them forward. And it's just so great to see. It's so exciting. You're reminding me so much, because um, I did sociology and I was 21. So, and you know, a bit of my backstory, I think, which was that I was excluded from every school I went to. And then I finally got to do a couple of A-levels, which I did pretty, pretty shitly. Um, but for some reason, um, it, you know, it was identified that I might be a good person to come to Goldsmiths. And um, I didn't believe anybody, but I came anyway. And my third year dissertation was on self-esteem, and people who'd been in care and was completely embedded in my own experience but I was in lots of denial about that because I hadn't really unpicked any of that experience um, so it's really interesting listening to you because 
nobody really did that with me then. Now, it, by the time I was in the third year, it would have been 93, so mm -hmm. 93, 94. Now, it wasn't that I wasn't encouraged, because I was, and it wasn't that I wasn't given opportunities, but I was. I mean, I certainly didn't know how to write an essay, and nobody sat down and taught me how to do that. So I was there three years before I kind of sussed out what that looked like. Um, but I remember doing my um, dissertation, and what a difference that would have made if someone had said, wow, you know, because I ended up going into um my profession not not only not knowing how to talk about where i'd come from but also not thinking it was relevant and actually wanting to hide it because of the shame factor like so many people but i didn't know that then so it's really interesting to me to think about what what would that have altered um what what would that have enabled me to go into the professions with my head held high with a kind of pride like that person you're describing will wear that experience as part of her very fabric of being yeah exactly it, it's it's just a life it's just a life yes i love that it's just a life it's just that human human beings having a human experience and yeah that them and us um dialogue that you described when you talked about that that poor boy's experience of going into that school um is on you know can have very fatal consequences i mean that's the truth it's appalling i mean it 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 permeates everything i i have a lot of students because we're situated on the overground in southeast london um, I have a lot of students from East London, Tara Hamlets and Newham, a lot of Bengali Muslim students um, and Somali students as well. And um, they will write their application and they'll put that they did French at school and then they'll come in for an interview because I like to try and interview as many as possible because that's where I get those stories, you see. And um, I'll say to them, oh, do you have any other languages? And they'll be like, oh, yeah, I, I speak Mongoli, but, but, and I'll say, what do you mean, but? And they'll say, well, I don't have a GCSE in it. And I'll, and, and I'll say, so? Imagine you're going for a teaching or a social work job in Tower Hamlets, and there's you and somebody else, and you're both brilliant, but you speak the language of a lot of the people you're going to be looking after. Who do you think is going to get that job? And they'll be like, oh, I will. And the problem is that a lot of our schools don't value people's home languages. They don't read the research which said, says that neurologically, if you are allowed to play around in your home language, it's gonna make everything else better, including English, maths, music, everything. And I say to these applicants, you know, it's not your fault that you feel like that. It's the institution's fault for not valuing your home language. So even down to things like that, which, which don't necessarily feel like a stigmatised thing, often they'll be embarrassed to say that they speak another language. And, you know, there's something really wrong with the way we're doing things if people are embarrassed to talk about this incredible skill that they have. Mm. Absolutely. So we've got policy. We've got meeting shame with wow. Empathy, then wow. Because we don't want to miss out the empathy bit. Meeting oh. shame with empathy, then wow. Um, we've got um, altering language so that it has that inclusiveness. What else do you think? What else do you think we can come away with? Because I, I love that you find the podcasts interviews very hopeful. And I am a bubble of hope. And I guess if ever that stops, then that would have to be, <laughs> that would have to be the end. <laughs> because it is that, that hopefulness is actually such an important thread for us all. So what else do you think we can we can alter and shift? I mean, apart from the entire education department at Goldsmiths, which is just like, that just rocks. <laughs> um, I think it's about encouraging everybody involved in this stuff to just keep their mind open and keep learning, 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 learning. You know, to read about neuroscience, to read about attachment, to read the research and understand it and for 
for leaders and people who, you know, employers to give practitioners, social workers and teachers and everybody else the space to read and learn and talk because it's not difficult to convince somebody that this stuff works if they're given the evidence about it. It's problematic when schools take on a whole idea hook, line and sinker without properly thinking about the implications of it. And that's where you can end up with issues like I've heard of children being given an ACE score and their mm. parents being given an ACE score, which can be very shaming. Yeah. You know, that's all wrong. Another example is um, teachers might think, oh, we've got to do LGBT inclusion. So they have a debate in class about whether it's OK to be gay. And you've got the kids sitting in the back thinking, I'm not going to open my mouth because I'll be I'll be bullied afterwards. So these things can go wrong. So in order to prevent that from happening and to convince everybody that we need to all be doing this stuff, it's about opening up space for education and reading and thinking and talking and mm. allowing the adults to have that space to do that kind of stuff. And then talking yeah. to the kids about it. And you've just really hit on the, um, the, the emerging idea in education, which isn't a new one for social work, but it is for education, which is around reflection and supervision. Because if there isn't that opportunity to step back and really think about what does it mean to bring this into the school? What does it look like at every level? What are the domains um, of this in terms of what it looks like? And certainly that's work that I'm currently doing, um, particularly with virtual schools. You know, what are the domains and how do we know that each domain has the is able to be um whether it's attachment aware trauma-informed ace educated you know what is it what does that look like at every level so and, and it's a very beautiful thing that actually starting to deepen and understand reflection and reflective practice being something that we're doing all the time that reflection isn't something you go off and do you know although you do um, that is part of hopefully what we're all doing but reflective practice is that stuff where we're we're taking a pause we're taking a step back all the time throughout the course of our work and then utilizing supervision lots of schools are integrating supervision uh, which means that, that that can really deepen those conversations and this is progress because three years ago supervision reflection and teaching were not you know, sitting in the same coffee it's, shop. It's huge. When I heard Kiran Gill talking about the difference, I just thought, thank God, because when I was working at, in a local authority with permanently excluded kids, I was doing multi-agency support work with the same kids that had social workers. So me and the social worker, we were both talking about child sexual abuse, domestic violence, drug addiction, and then she was going off and having clinical supervision and I was just going home. And that's yeah. not right. It's not right. And our teachers and our university lecturers, they're all dealing with exactly the same issues. And we have, we have talked about reflective practice for years, but we've never woven in a system that supports that in education. And the idea of actually having supervision is it's groundbreaking. It has to happen. And, you know, people might think it's expensive, but it's money out for huge value in. Mm. Well worth it. It's weight in gold, really. Yeah. So there we are. That's absolutely fantastic. Anna, that's been quite, that's felt like quite a different conversation from lots of my conversations. Um, and I've really enjoyed it. And we've tapped and weaved our way through various things that, sometimes I think have been missed in some of the conversations that I've had and I I don't want them to be missed because they are part of the broader picture that I want everyone to be thinking about so thank you Anna thank you. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed your experience on here as well it's been wonderful and I think your podcast is a huge force in the idea of educating people that we've been talking about. I think it's really important and I share it all the time. Thank you, Anna. Well, you have a great day. Okay.